the title for for this episode is decking unemployment um and that's a very very bad pun (laughs) it's not good in the least but uh today um we are going to be talking about jobs um so if you're concerned about unemployment this is the episode for you well maybe not necessarily because we're not talking about that kind of job but knowing about run deck jobs might help you get a employment job so listen carefully uh, I'm I'm about to I'm about to school you. In, oh goodness! In how to get over unemployment? So Ron, Ron Deck has a concept of jobs, and uh, today we're we're gonna go over that and and we're gonna see how jobs uh, are are really the core functionality of Run Deck. Last episode we went over projects, and and that's mainly how Run Deck the application is organized. How Run Deck the application can split up responsibilities can can segment uh, access into different things uh, but run deck jobs are really the things that run deck as the engine uh, is is meant to run so these are the scripts these are the automations these are you know everything that you're you're doing in run deck is going to be triggered by a job so i am as usual, going to defer to their documentation, uh, which I link in the very top of the the page here. And it says this chapter, <clears throat> excuse me. So this, this chapter covers how to run and create jobs. So they have they have plenty here. They have way more than we do. And I'm I'm really only documenting in Bookstack what we do and how we do it and and what I'm knowledgeable about. And they have they have a lot more uh, to it. And they go into a lot more detail on it. Um, but I'm going to walk through a couple things after reading this introduction f- in their manual. So they say, why create a job? Uh, and it says, one might find a certain command executions are done repeatedly and perhaps represent what has become a routine procedure. Another user in your group needs a simple self-service interface to run a procedure across a set of nodes. Or routine processes need to be encapsulated and become the basis for other routine procedures so these are all jobs we can we 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 have a trend here and and i like that they point that out in that uh, a lot of what they're describing here is stuff that is already ongoing uh in which the process that is ongoing they would like to encapsulate or automate or, or something of the sort the last thing you ever want to do with automation is go from zero to 60 Right in the blink of an eye, you want to step your way through your gears as you rev up the engine of this car analogy. Uh, so you you want to you you want to not not jump into the automation straight away, right? You, you, you want to see how things actually happen, how things fall out in reality. Because if you don't you don't see that fall out in reality. You could be months down the road in in automation or or putting stuff together, and you just find out well this this just plain out doesn't work. Right. Um, and by doing that manually, the, at least the first couple times, you can say, "All right, this is kind of a sustainable process." Especially if you you do it looking, you know, forward looking towards, you know, I would like to automate this in the future. How can I, you know, what are the things I need to uh, to uh, extract right uh, and what is some of the variation that I can kind of take take out of this and I can say well it's always going to be named this way and we're just going to do it that way because not just because I say so or because you know I'm a, I'm a tyrant but because that is what is going to enable us to automate this is is by standardizing uh, what we do routinely right and instead of it becoming you know a a a a craft or becoming a a bespoke uh, method each and every time that you know one person is responsible right. for you know make it something that's repeatable um, and that you do over and over again and and multiple people do over and over again to kind of uh, check you know what your assumptions right so you can get that feedback and then I think at that point you have a good solid foundation to look into something like run deck jobs and say, how can we encapsulate this routine process? Um, how can we uh, put this routine job uh, into some kind of automation? Right. So that being a long winded explanation as to what jobs are, where can we find them? Uh, so the jobs link uh, is on the left-hand column. 
uh, and that will take us to a listing of all the jobs in the project, right? So, so inside of a project live all of the jobs. Uh, from there, all the runnable jobs are displayed in alphabetical order in their job group. And uh, I have a picture in the documentation here that highlights uh, where the length of the project jobs are, where the length of the project groups are, and the runnable jobs themselves. Uh, it's, it's just easier to think about job groups as folders and runnable jobs as files, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at what essentially looks like a file system with folders and, and jobs inside of those folders. Uh, note that if you don't have a folder, they're going to be displayed at the bottom underneath all of the job groups. So you don't have to have job groups. You don't have to have those folders, but they do come in handy if you want to organize what you're doing. Uh, now to create a new job, uh, at the, the top right under job actions, uh, there's an option to add a new job. And, and that really only requires two things. It requires a job name. And it requires something to do. Uh, it requires a step in the workflow. I love it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I quick anecdote here. Uh, when I was testing out actually the commit for uh, streaming input from run, put, run deck data, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to run any of our production infrastructure changes or jobs on this instance because I knew it would basically either send it back to a state I didn't want it or it would send it to a new state where it's just completely wiped the stuff completely wiped the instance or it would delete the instance or what have you so what I did I went in I created a job and the job was one it was a one liner it was a for loop or a while loop it was a bash do while that ran I think a hundred times and it slept five seconds so Nice. Something easy, something quick, but it was when you talk about a definition, a job definition, it can be one line. It can be echo hello. So, yeah, everything else besides that, uh, like I say, is is optional. Strongly suggested. Totally. But optional nonetheless. Uh, so, as as we go through Rundeck, I mean, this is a very very complicated piece of software. Uh, so we're, we're trying to break it up as as best we can. Uh, so the, the rest of this documentation here is when you're creating a job or going to edit a job, what are the sections that you're going to come across? Uh, so the keep in mind that that's how we uh, break this down. I have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, sections to go over here. Uh, we're going to obviously spend the most on workflow and the actual meat and potatoes of it, but we've yeah. got a, a couple other things to, to cover as well. So the first uh, tab when you go to edit a job is the job details itself. Uh, this is fairly simple. This is the job name, job group, and the job description. So job name shows up on the main jobs page. The job group uh, are those sections on the main jobs page, like the folders, like we were talking about. And then the description actually does show up on that front page too, as, as small text uh, under any given job uh, on that on that jobs page. Okay. Uh, now the job group does have the ability to browse any existing job groups that you have. Uh, if you want to create a new job group, you literally just put in any name that you want and it will be created for you. Uh, and then it will also be an option going forward for all of the new jobs or all the uh, other jobs if you're going to edit them uh, to choose that group as well. Uh, so it's pretty free form. I had to figure out, you know, I, d I don't have to create one beforehand. I can literally just, just create one the, as I create yeah. that job. Yeah. Uh, and then the next thing we want to go into, and this is probably going to take the rest of my time here, but the, the workflow, right? Uh, so job workflows, uh, the job's most basic feature is its ability to execute one or more steps. The sequence of steps is called a workflow. The steps of the job's workflow are displayed when viewing a job's detail from the job listing or within the job editor form. So as we're, we're talking through going to the job editor form, we're going to talk about the workflow here. There are several notable sections to the workflow. Um, and uh, each change, uh, as you you are editing stuff on this tab, uh, each of these these subsections uh, will prompt you to to save uh, any new entry. 
um, before you can save the entire thing. So if you if you are making different changes here, there, and everywhere, and you scroll down to the bottom of the page and hit save, uh, that will actually not save you. It will prompt you to run back up and, and save the other I've thing. I've run into that. And I, I was hitting save. I hit save on the job or the workflow. I'm thinking, okay, this is fine. What's going on? I'm thinking I hit save again. It pops up with a little yellow error. You have not saved, you know, whatever. I didn't read it because I just was being lazy. I hit save again. It didn't go again. Like, what is going on here? I undo all my changes. I hit save. It doesn't go. I hit cancel. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on with this workflow? What the heck's the problem? It's finally take my time to sit down. And in that workflow part, it forces it. There's a little tiny save button right there that you have to click. Sure enough, you save the workflow and it goes. And I'm like, oh, well, of course. So, so that, that is, yes, required as, as you have found out. Uh, but it, I don't know how they do it. You, you said before that run deck feels like a UI that's been wrapped around an API that's been programmed. Yeah. And this is one of the things I think where that really does stand out. You say, all right, why is it expecting me to save these small sections when I would expect to just save the big page? And it's like, well, that's how the API was coded. Like that's, it expects a new variable. You're going to save that new variable and you're not going to save everything, you know, as, as part of one post. So now talking about the, the options, um, these, uh, the, the first section in the workflow, uh, these are arguments or variables that are set when the job is run. Uh, so inside of the options, uh, some of the interesting things to set are the name. Uh, and this is actually the name that you're going to be using when you pass it to different steps uh, as a variable and how you encode it and, and, and uh, how it gets invoked. Uh, and then the label which is actually the prompt that you see when you go to run the job. So the label is the human readable part of it. Think of it, uh, you know, like you have a label maker and you totally label all of your cables in your data center meticulously. Sure. Um, as one does. Uh, that is the human readable part of it uh, that gets plugged into the, the, you know, whatever high number port, right, that no one's going to remember, but they're going to remember, you know, uh, this name. is Facebook's DNS manager. Do not <laughs> unplug. So that when someone unplugs it, you know, they pick it right out of the wall. Oh, that was the main router, <laughs> main edge router. Yeah, <laughs> and I know that because that's what the label says. <laughs> uh, and then let's see other other options here for arguments and variables. Input type. Uh, so they have three types. Uh, they have text uh, and they have password, which I would expect. They also include date. So like you, they have a they have a custom way to to pass in the date. I've never used it because I've never had to, uh, but I don't I don't know how that gets passed or if you're able to manipulate it in a special way. I'm not sure. It's just I find it odd that they would have a separate date field rather than literally just anything else. More text you know. or yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so you can choose if you want it to be a text, uh, a, a encrypted password, or a date. Uh, and then one of the other things that I use is the allowed values and the restrictions. And I use those in tandem. So the allowed values are a common separated list of values that you can enter, right? Um, and the restrictions on them uh, can enforce from that list or can allow anything, right? So uh, especially handy in like a, uh, a, a variable that uh, produces a, a checkbox list right where you want to check you know multiple um, entries you would uh, enter in those allowed values and then you would restrict them to only anything in that list uh, similarly a, a drop down like a true or false drop down uh, you accomplish that by including true and false as the two allowed values and then putting the restrictions as you know enforcing from the allowed values list uh, so those two work in tandem to allow you to create these these constraint, and that's why you know you, you start to see this as a as a part of self service, right? You say, all right, I'm only going to allow these three kernel versions to be listed, or uh, this is only going to be true or false, or this is For only going to be up till ten. Oh, these applications are going to be listed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is this is where you know you, you talk about Rundeck being able to to share stuff with other people. You know you say, 
uh, this is how you constrain their ability to to choose to shoot themselves in the foot, right? Yeah, it's it's basically saying you have a you have a a, a range of motion that does not include you your have foot. the gun. Yeah, right, right. So, um, and moving on from from the variables, we have the workflow control. Uh, so this is uh, these are these are kind of peripheral options. As far as like what happens if you run, uh, what happens about the the meta run itself? So like, if a step fails, what do you do? Uh, you have the option to stop immediately, or you have the option to run everything else before you fail. Um, you have how do you want to execute it? Given that run deck is supposed to be run on or is able to run on multiple nodes at the same point, do you want to run node by node by node, or do you want to run them all in parallel? Um, how, how do you want that to be executed? It doesn't matter for us because we're only running on one node, which is localhost. Uh, but they do have a handy like explain drop down, which will give you demos of like what does what do these three options yeah, actually right. mean? So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the also global log filters, of which I uh, use one and am interested in looking into the other because uh, one is masking passwords. So uh, like we were talking about before, if the input type of one of your variables is a password, then you can actually mask that in the output. Run deck will see that, oh, this, this plain text I was output matches the password that I passed in there. Let me redact that so that's not available to whoever's viewing the log. Um, and, and this is especially handy because we have stored passwords in Rundeck, and those stored passwords also get passed to the executions. It's not a password that we put in every single time. Those are also redacted for us. So that's that's doing the rest of the work to kind of secure ourselves uh, against uh the the stuff that uh, having to enter a password every time it's just one more field yeah. right something else it's one more thing exactly. to mess up exactly um, and then we come to the most important part so these are the steps right so these are the where the actual executions are structured um, there are a lot of options and ways to construct this so I'm only like I said before I'm only going to lay out what I'm familiar with um, so they have two different ways to run this, and it's uh, it's node steps, which are run once for every node, and workflow steps, steps, which are run once per workflow. Now, once again, since we're only running localhost, this really doesn't mean much to us. Um, but the node steps uh, include a script, uh, like being able to run a shell script, uh, if, if we had that. Um, and also a command. So that's running a command from the command line. Now that is 90% of what we're doing here is, is running commands. We don't run the built-in Ansible playbook um, because we want we have an execution prep which sets up our directories ephemerally uh, with the file structure hierarchy that we want to see. We basically run a command to cd into that directory and run ansible playbook uh, by hand with custom arguments right now one thing that we could do to enhance that functionality is by writing a plugin that would do all of that for us within the plugin with us simply supplying the variables because right now we're writing out you know handcrafted shell scripts and putting them into the the command of of run deck which is not what that's really supposed to be it's really more so supposed to be just a simple invocation uh, of a command and we've really been squeezing that one for all it's totally worth. um so, so the right thing to do would be to look into how Ansible Playbook uh, adopts its its functionality, or look into writing our own plugin uh, to do that. But most of our sh steps are, you know, easily accomplishable by running shell scripts. I mean, the first one we do is we run the execution prep script. Uh, the second one we do is we run the Ansible Playbook. 
uh, script. And the third one is we run a small cleanup command that will remove that directory structure because, like I said, these are ephemeral directories. Uh, any kind of paper trail we would want is going to be uh, kept in the job log with all the secrets redacted. You know, so so we are we're going through and trying to clean up after ourselves, not leave any kind of a uh, a trace that could could help you know someone someone pop our instance or something like that. Um, so definitely something, you know, we're, we're trying to be security minded about this. Uh, and as much as I, I rag on us for, for doing it, you know, the, the dirty way, it gets exactly done what we need it to get done. Uh, and, and no more. That's the good job of any tool, right? It does what we need it to do. We use it the way. We use it the way. They provide it to us. How about that? I I won't say we use it as intended because I know they they it seems like a big tool for going out to nodes and then running scripts on nodes. Whereas we just we're running this thing locally on the box that Rundex on, and we're gonna do what we need to do with Ansible. I mean, I've said it once and I'll say it again, but we, you know we use this as as a replacement for hands on keyboard. Yeah. Right? this is our automation front end. Right, if I have to. If I have to run, you know, five different commands over and over and over again, well, no, I don't because I've already it's automated, automated it. No. Yep. Yeah. It's automated. So this is this is a, a replacement for that. And it's so easy to simply throw in a um, a command, you know, exactly how I would be typing it in, you know, and, and, and variableizing what I can. When it gets to a point where it, it does become too wieldy, right? Or uh, one of the other things I was thinking about is where it would require like a massive change across all of the uh, all of the nodes. At that point, that may be uh, functionality to say, "Hey, can we write a plugin that would abstract all of this for us?" Right, right. And then we just run that. Um, so, so something to something to consider. But I mean, we we're not running into that yet. We we've got other things that we want to get done on the plate. Yeah, yeah right. Plenty right. of other things uh, for for us to do in our time. Uh, so with the remaining five minutes, uh, I'm going to run over the other four uh, sections here, but I wanted yeah. to to uh, quickly stop and, and see if you had any any input on that or any questions. No, I think we talked about it already. The hand, you know, we use it the way it's intended, maybe not the way it's intended, but it fits our case, right? It does what we yeah. want it to do and need it to do. That's all I had. That's really all I had. Exactly. So uh, as I said before, uh, we run locally on our nodes. Um, so there is an, a whole section about nodes and, and about how to do that. And I'm going to skip that entirely because literally we only run a local host and it works just fine for us. Uh, the next is a schedule, which we actually talked about, I believe, last uh, last episode. But you're able to uh, run it repeat- repeatedly. Um, and you're also ena- able to enable scheduling and enable execution entirely. Um, so you can actually disable execution um, by by that logic. You can actually disable execution of a job and still have it present, right? You could just say, this isn't going to be run right now. Now, where that would come in handy, I think we were talking about this, but um, if you wanted to put something in maintenance mode, you got to say, I want to disable any future runs of this for the next two days, right? You would, you would disable that execution, do what you have to do, and then re-enable the execution. Um, so that's where I could see that coming in handy. Uh, next section uh, I really don't use, so I, I copied the link to the documentation from Rundeck about this, uh, but notifications, uh, right? You can notify on start, on success, on failure, on retrieval failure, and on average duration exceeded. And Lord help me if I notify on average duration exceeded because that is a shot in the dark by Rundeck. But <laughs> it's so av- – well, it's – Average duration is not it's it's a terrible metric. It, why aren't percentiles it used? I, I could go on I can go on and on about, you know, your ninety ninth, your ninety fifth percentiles are gonna show you much so much more than oh, this is the average duration. Well that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything yeah. to me. What why like yeah. I don't care. Fine, fine. It takes well, five and, minutes on average. What a- happens until you know, the job that goes two hours, it's like, oh well, that just blew the average out of the wall, you know. The average out, but yeah, it, I I had a I had a talk. Uh, I think it was at two years ago at it, 
at Ohio Linux Fest. And I was talking about doing basically CICD testing uh, and looking at uh, metrics and figuring out, you know, where, where where infrastructure as code needs to be tested and maintained and, you know, analyzed. And uh, I, I got that question, you know, is the tool, you know, the front end, the automation front end you're using, is that not providing you, you know, enough data? It's like, well, I could scrape the data, like the data is there, but it does not have the tools to analyze it. Like you said, you get a lot more actionable information from the 99th to 95th percentile, right, than a strict average. Right. So. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Those notifications, I don't know if I strictly use them in the API in the API webhooks I know are available for jobs, which we were kind of doing early on. Uh, we've since moved away from them. But those... I know you have them listed here as notifications. They also come in as statuses as well. So you can, mm. when basically when you're pulling the API and the, the job itself, you can say, what what's the status of this job? And obviously there are a bit different ones. Um, you know, it's start running, aborted. There are a handful of other ones, but it's kind of the same as notifications. Again, with notifications though, fine send me any you know you can send me an email if you want i i don't know what i'm gonna yeah. what am i gonna do with this I, I i probably kicked off the job if it was something you know maybe if you're in a larger organization it's gonna show up uh, as something that's maybe more useful but again maybe not so they're out there they're available i have more email filters than i care to mention yep yes yep yep uh, and lastly, since I'm, I'm just about at time here, uh, there are a couple of things under the other tab which are interesting, uh, namely the log level. Surprise, surprise, debug log level produces more output. Uh, that's certainly helpful while debugging, um, and it's it's nice to be able to have in there, but it's not nice if you're trying to parse the information no. like Jack is. Nope. Yep. Uh, multiple executions, which I didn't know this was a switch until I needed it to be a switch. Uh, so allow this job to be executed more than one time simultaneously. Um, sometimes you don't want that. You know, sometimes you really only want one of these things going at once. Uh, we have many different instances that we definitely want on a recurring basis uh you know th that can be kicked off at any time simultaneous to any other time and that's kind of why we have the setup too right all these ephemeral you know directory setups that we do those are so that we can have these side-by-side -side executions right if if i'm executing something in one directory i don't need that directory to, to disappear it. from right. underneath me right i know that my my separate job executions are going to be in separate directories uh let, next we have the timeout uh, and, and you can time out a job, uh, retie, uh, retry, excuse me. Uh, and then the default tab, which I found since we only run one execution, uh, well, an execution on one node on localhost, uh, that it's best for us to change to the log output. And that shows us exactly what you would expect to see in like the console if you're running it from the command line. Uh, so if if you're looking at this and you're asking yourself why do I have to you know go through three or four different clicks to get to like the console output what I would be expecting to see go ahead and go to that other tab and change that default tab to log output and you should be golden. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Run deck is a, a very highly visual uh, tool. I notice as I attempt to explain this going forward. Uh, I'm going to have fun going through the, uh, the, the integration session videos. Uh, those, those are going to be nice, uh, walking, walking through some of those, but there is just so many minute details, right. To, to all of this, right. To the jobs, to the projects, to, to everything that can be changed, tweaked and, and hacked around. Like I didn't, I didn't even say about, you know, how in the command step, uh, if you want to double quote something, put three double quotes around it because that escapes the, you know, the double quote. All these just little things that you find out having worked with it, um, the way it uh, executes, you know, having having 
uh, a workflow that fails, but also cleans it up when something fails and then fails it, you know, having, having that, uh, on failure handler, right? So there's, there's tons of stuff to this and we just can't get that in depth with it because we just don't have the time really, or the medium. This isn't necessarily right. the medium to get in that in depth with it. Uh, but if, if this is something that you say, my 50% of my job, I would like to automate away, please, right? I'm, I'm doing all these processes over and over and over and over and over again, right? This is something we do have experience with. This is something we would sit down and say, all right, how are you doing this? You know, what variables do we need to control for? And how can we get your process that you're doing on a repeated basis? How, how can we get that process into some automation? Um, because we would love to see you do more with what you have than you're doing now. Absolutely. I'm all on board with it. Uh, I, and I, you can do that by going to rcompose.com. Yeah. Or reaching out on the website, even if you know someone who's have, running into the issue or wants to automate something, direct them to the site. But I had a great lead in. You threw me off there with the. Sorry. Uh, walk in with the uh, little pitch there at the end. Um.